Now, Croesus was the first barbarian known to us who subjugated and demanded tribute from some Hellenes. Although he made friends with others, he subjugated the Ionians, the Aeolians, the Asian Dorians, and made friends with the Spartans. Before the reign of Croesus, all Hellenes had been free. Herodotus. Hello, my name is Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 46, Anatolia, West to Ionia. Last episode we began our look at the most eastern region of our survey of the Greek periphery. The Greeks would become heavily involved along the Anatolian coast, but we took a more zoomed out approach to look at the history of the entire region of Anatolia. This saw us looking back into the deep past, where first signs of human occupation could be seen, with scattered remains stretching over hundreds of thousands of years. It would be with the onset of the Neolithic and the end of the Ice Age some 12,000 years ago, where we would then begin to see some more organised sophisticated societies develop. Though much around the sites that have been uncovered still remain somewhat mysterious. The discoveries of the last hundred years have also seen conventional thinking around the development of human societies questioned, with it seeming the transition from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a more sedentary one was taking place earlier in the region than thirst fought. As the Neolithic would move towards the Bronze Age, we would start to get our first glimpses of historically attested cultures, before then seeing the rise of one of the first known empires in the region. The Hittites would come to control much of the lands of Anatolia, while also exerting control over the smaller kingdoms in the west dotted along the Hellespont and the Aegean. Though like many Bronze Age civilizations around the Mediterranean, they would disappear as the Bronze Age collapse took hold. This would see the region slip away from a large, organized civilization, controlling vast swaths of the land. Instead, Anatolia and especially the western regions would fragment into smaller kingdoms and principalities. Though with time, recovery would take place seeing the formation of great civilizations once again, and on the scale unlike seen before. In this episode, we're going to shift our focus a little more to the western areas of Anatolia, with Ionia at the centre. We will first begin by looking at the situation after the Bronze Age collapse and what the region looked like. We will also see the resurgence of empire in the form of the Neo Assyrians enter back into the region, before they too would fall and be replaced by the largest empire yet seen in the world the Persian Empire. Along the way, we will also be looking in at one of the largest kingdoms in western Anatolia, that of the Lydians, before the Persian expansion west. While we will also see the Greeks from the mainland enter into the region, which would lead to the region of Ionia being formed. We will just be looking at a general overview of the Greeks in Ionia for now, as I have an interview episode planned that will be focusing on this in more detail. So, let us now begin by taking ourselves back to the region as the Bronze Age collapse had taken place, seeing the disappearance of the Hittites, and then the weakening of the Assyrians after their short-lived expansion into parts of Anatolia. In the wake of the Hittite collapse, the western parts of Anatolia fragmented into individual governed cities that controlled the immediate lands surrounding them. Some of the areas controlled were larger than others, but this effectively saw many small kingdoms arise. Cultural markers have allowed archaeologists to identify a number of these smaller kingdoms retaining some form of cultural continuity with the previous Hittite Empire, seeing certain elements remain active in a number of regions that the Hittite control had exerted into. Though with these connections to the now collapsed Hittite Empire, other elements culturally would also set them apart from the Bronze Age Empire. These kingdoms would now, heading into the Iron Age, be labelled Neo-Hittite, but not to be confused as being part of a larger empire. We would see a similar scenario take place further around the old Hittite heartland and south into Syria, where these kingdoms known as Luwian and Aramean would be labelled Syrio-Hittite. Back in western Anatolia, the largest of the identified kingdoms would be that of the newly formed Phrygians, who had recently arrived due to the power vacuum left when the Hittites collapsed. The Phrygians are identified as being of Indo-European origins, with one possible scenario seeing them having migrated from Thracian lands into Anatolia during the Bronze Age collapse with this also suggesting they may have been part of the invasions of the Sea Peoples at some stage, though it's important to note that much around the Phrygians' origins are still debated today. Just before we move on to the rise of the Neo-Assyrians in the region, I want to mention that this is the period that we also see another small kingdom form that will become central to our look at Western Anatolia and Ionia. This would be that of Meonia, or better known as the Lydians. We'll be looking closer at the Lydians later in the episode, but this is where they first enter the historical record. As we saw last episode, the Assyrian Empire had gone into decline along with most other regions during the period of the collapse of the Bronze Age. Much of the region that the Empire had been in control of seems to have entered a 150 year Dark Age. 
though the Assyrians would recover out of this period and on the rise again by the end of the 10th century BC, in what is now called the Neo-Assyrian Empire. This would be the next major empire to rise in the area of Anatolia and would control more lands than any empire before it. The empire would come to dominate a large portion of the Near East, controlling the eastern parts of Anatolia, Mesopotamia, ancient Iran, the Levant, northern parts of Arabia and Egypt. The western Anatolian kingdoms of Lydia and Phrygia would remain intact though appear at some stage to have been defeated by the Assyrian Empire with them having to provide tribute to them. There are also indications that trade heading east and west from western Anatolia was also taking place. As we have seen with many empires, much pressure was inflicted on them through expanding their borders and coming in contact with other powers. Maintaining the empire on these borders was also a constant struggle. Not only did the Neo-Assyrian Empire have its own borders proper, but at its height it was able to exert control into many lands not considered within the empire's boundaries. This would see many seemingly independent states forced into some form of tribute and providing a sort of buffer zone around the Assyrian territory. Though by the 7th century internal problems with the empire, mainly through civil war, would see the borders weakened, with many of these former regions of tribute becoming hostile to the Assyrians. The internal problems would begin to see the stability of the empire from without also fracture, which would ultimately see the neo assyrian Empire fall by the end of the 7th century. One of the powers that would take a central role in its collapse would be that of the Medes, who in turn are central in the rise to the Persians, who would come to control all of Anatolia and the regions of Ionia. So let's now turn to their rise through the fall of the neo assyrians Looking at the context of the fall of the Assyrians, we will be focusing on the Medes and the Persians for the most part. They would both become part of the Persian Empire that would develop and enter into the Greek periphery. We covered the rise of the Medes and the Persians with some detail in the episodes looking at the Persian Empire some time ago. So I will not be repeating all that again, especially Herodotus's tales, but rather give us a refresher on their coming to power in the region. When it comes to evidence of the Medes, we have no accounts that they left behind to refer to. All of our understanding of them comes from archaeological sites, Herodotus and Assyrian tablets. It's important to note here that often it is difficult to reconcile what's found in Herodotus' account and what's recorded in the Assyrian tablets. We need to keep in mind when it comes to the origin stories of many people in Herodotus, we are for the most part given accounts of legend, and it would seem that the same is taking place around the origins of the Median Empire. We even find with the story around its first ruler a common theme arise. Herodotus would give us an account that is very similar to a general rise in power of a number of Greek tyrants. This account reminds me a lot of the rise to power we get of Pisistratus in the histories. Though in the case of the Medes, the rise would be after the fall of the neo assyrians had taken place, illustrating how the fall of one autocratic regime led to another. I mentioned the Medes as an empire just before, and this is the picture we get from Herodotus giving us a neat transition of power from one successive empire to the next. Though, as historians have been interpreting more and more Assyrian descriptions, this previously accepted view has now been challenged. But the picture presented in Assyrian records involving the Medes trails off by 650 BC, after this time being where the Medes would lose authority to the Persians and being incorporated into their empire. The picture we get from the Assyrians, who first record them in the 9th century, was that the Medes would inhabit the lands in the central and northern Zagros Mountains, though it is very difficult to detect their origins before this. They are specifically mentioned as dwellers in fortified settlements dotted along the Zagros, each of these settlements being headed by a city lord, indicating rather than being a unified group, governmentally, they seem to be independent in this regard to one another, with just the Median culture identifiers connecting them. Perhaps we could even think of them in a similar fashion to the Greek city-state system, to some degree in this way. It seems the Median settlements were left to their own devices for the early stages of the Assyrian rule, with only references to controlling lands around their settlements when they were near important trade routes. One other factor is also presented that would see raids conducted on the Medes, and this was in regards to their reputation in raising horses, the Assyrians looking to capture these horses for their own use. Though as the Neo-Assyrians had reached their height, many of the Median territories would end up coming under control of the Assyrians. So the picture we get through the Assyrian sources do not point to a unified Median people, but as the Assyrians would decline, so too would the information on the Medes. This period of decline and collapse by 610 BC to the establishment of the Persian Empire by the 550s 
would see a gap in the median record where it is difficult to detect what had been taking place politically. So, as I've pointed out, the Assyrian Empire had collapsed by 610 BC, and the Medes, who were a part of the empire, played a central role in helping bring down the Assyrians as their decline had set in. During this time, a coalition of Median tribes joined forces with the Babylonians and other peoples, who had also been under Assyrian rule. The major players in the coalition, though, seemed to have been the Medes and the Babylonians. Once the coalition had waged a series of wars on the declining Assyrians and defeated them, the Babylonians emerged into what we could call the Neo-Babylonian Empire. This is when it's most likely that the Medes could have formed an empire, or it would seem at least a kingdom that would be centred on Ekbakna, located in western Iran. Though if there was a Median Empire, it would be short-lived, as a group known as the Persians, who make no appearance in the Assyrian records, would now appear and come to dominate the entire region. In our episode on the Persian Empire, we focused a great deal on the legendary stories of the establishment of the empire. In this episode though, I will just run through what appears to have taken place with the Persians' rise to jog our memories. Most Persian historians think that Persia was its own small kingdom that existed in southwest Iran, just south of Media. They seem to have migrated into the region in the early 1st millennium BC, and have been centred on a city known as Anchun. The two kingdoms of Media and Persia then seem to have fought each other as independent regions, most likely over territory, trade or control over an important city such as Susa. Once the Medes were defeated, Cyrus incorporated them into his empire with ease mainly due to programs of respecting their customs and traditions. The first indication that we get of the Persians as being a rising power in the region is through Babylonian texts, with one during the reign of Nabonidus, highlighting the Persians' conquest of the Medes. This would come through an inscription of an omen through a dream, where the king was concerned about the threat the Medes posed to one of his construction efforts. The inscription has the god Marduk replying to Nabonidus' concerns. The Medes of who you speak, he, his land, and the kings who go at his side, are no longer a threat. When the third year came, the gods roused Cyrus, king of Anshan, his young servant, against the Mede. With his small army, he dispersed the vast Medes. Cyrus seized the Styges, the king of the Medes, and took him captive to his land. There are a couple of points of irony in this inscription, with the Medes now labelled not a threat to him, and second, calling Cyrus the servant of the gods, this presumably being the Babylonian ones. With Cyrus's defeat of the Medes, he had now in fact become more of a threat, since this increased the Persian power and influence to where they could now challenge larger powers in the region. Also, the inscription shows Cyrus as being the servant of the Babylonian gods, though later on, he would also become the servant of another god, Yahweh in the Torah, or later, God in the Bible. In this role, Cyrus would capture Babylon incorporated into his empire, also freeing the Jewish people held captive there. I think we'll leave the Persians there for now, plus we did cover the rise over two episodes earlier in the series. We will come back to them at the end of the episode, as they will become part of the Greek story over in Ionia. Now I want to head over to the western parts of Anatolia, where we start to see more connections to the Greeks. Here we will also look at their entry into the region of the Mediterranean, while also looking at the Lydian Empire, who would be the first to exert control over the Greeks in Ionia. First though, let's turn to the Greeks arrival along the Anatolian coast. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I have been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. So far, we have seen how the Greeks were active in sending out expeditions to found new colonies at the end of the Dark Ages and into the Archaic period. Just about no region around the Mediterranean was off limits to the various city-states looking to ease the pressures they suffered through overpopulation and food shortages, which we have covered over before. Though when it comes to the Greeks in Anatolia, it would seem they had begun arriving even before the waves of colonising taking place in the 8th, 7th and 6th centuries. 
It would also appear that the Greeks' arrival may have started during the Bronze Age collapse, with many Mycenaeans migrating, perhaps as part of the Sea Peoples. We also have evidence that the Mycenaean Greeks had some sort of foothold in Anatolia during the Bronze Age, where references in Hittite texts place them in the region which we have brought up before in the series. There are also indications that further migrations were taking place as the geopolitical situations within Greece was changing in the wake of the Bronze Age collapse. Originally the tribal group known as the Ionians populated the northern Peloponnese and lands through into Attica. With the shifts in population taking place and much of the Peloponnese being occupied by Dorians, another tribal group, they migrated east with many colonising a number of Aegean islands and all the way to the Anatolian coast. These Ionians would come to settle in the central coast of Anatolia, where the region would become to be known as Ionia. To their north would be the region of Aeolia, also named after another Greek tribal group, the Aeolians. They would also come to migrate from their homelands in Greece, namely around the region of Thessaly. It's important to note here that these migrations appear to be gradual, perhaps with the initial waves settling in with the local populations before larger groups would make the journey to where proper Greek colonies would be established. The processes would be unfolding over a number of generations. Still, it appears that the colonies created in Ionia and Aeolia would be some of the earliest, as they would also send out their own expeditions to found colonies during the Great Age of Greek colonisation during the 7th and 6th centuries. Another thing to keep in mind here is that these movements of groups within Greece that help explain the movements across the Aegean are based on literary works by ancient authors. Some near contemporaries, while others would have been separated by many generations of the time that the population movements were taking place. What we come to see as being established in Ionia were 12 main Greek cities that would form themselves into what is known as the Ionian League. This would be in the wake of an event known as the Malaic War, fought between the various Ionians against the Carians, who had occupied parts of the region the Ionians had been settling in. As you can probably guess, we have very little details about the war, like most events away from the Greek mainland during the 7th century, though the conflict would appear to be drawn out with its name being taken from the last stronghold to fall ending the war, Malaya, located around Makali, that site that we saw one of the last battles occur during the Greek and Persian wars. The various Ionian cities would remain pretty much autonomous for some 400 years since their establishment, though a larger threat now began to emerge to threaten their status, the Lydian Kingdom. The Lydian Kingdom had started to become more organised and began expanding by the time of their third dynasty had come to power at the start of the 7th century. Though, as we will see with our look at the Lydians in a minute, the Ionians, or at least a number of the cities, would be able to hold out and retain their independence, that is, until the fifth generation of kings came to the throne. As I pointed out at the start of the episode, I had decided to just give a brief run through of the Greeks in Ionia in this episode, as I have arranged an interview episode which will happen shortly that will be completely focused on Ionia and its biggest city Miletus, with a professor of history who wrote a book in this very subject, so I hope you will look forward to that one. For our look at Anatolia in the west during the Archaic Age, we need to explore a few lines of development separately, though they would all end up coming together and interacting, shaping the history of Ionia and Western Anatolia in general. We have first looked at the rise of the Medes and the Persians around the Zagros Mountains, where the Medes were instrumental in seeing the collapse of the Neo-Assyrians, before then seeing the Persians emerge as a dominant group. We then left them at this stage in their development, though they will enter back into the story as events unfold in the West. We then looked at how the Greeks arrived on the shores of Anatolia, and what would lead to this move where they would create Greek cities and a league all along the coast. Though, the lands they had moved into were not empty, as we have seen. As well as the local Carians, there had also been another kingdom that had developed in the region, which the Greek cities of Onia would interact with. This is the Kingdom of Lydia, and will be our third and final line of inquiry we will follow before we then start to see all three converge. We had looked at the Lydian Empire back when doing our episodes on the Persian Empire, though we'll have another look at their rise in history, though this time I will not expand as much on the traditional stories around Croesus that Herodotus reports, but focus more on the development of the Lydians from their earliest times. The Lydian Empire would have its origins during the decline of the Hittites during the 12th century BC, though it appears the power centre it first established itself around would not be known as Lydia. The Hittites had referred to this region as being part of Azawa, though during the time the Hittites were intact. 
Homer, in his work, The Iliad, refers to the area and its inhabitants as Myonians. Though we are unsure if this name originates during the end of the Bronze Age, or was a name from around the time Homer was writing. Remember, Homer was performing his poetry up to 400 years after the period of the supposed time of his chosen subject was taking place. Herodotus also refers to the Myonians as inhabiting the lands before they were known as the Lydians, which he tells us got their name through the first kings being ancestors of a legendary king named Lydus. Lydus appears to have been a king of Maeonia, and one would think to have his name assigned to an empire, something remarkable must have taken place. There is nothing clear cut in the historical record, but according to Herodotus, Lydus's father, Attis, had to deal with a great famine during his rule, and half the population would end up immigrating. What has also emerged in fragmentary form through Xanthus, a historian of Lydia, is that it seems Lydus was one of two sons, and when Attis died, the kingdom split, with Lydus remaining in the original lands. Now we come to some conjecture on my part. Perhaps Lydus was able to restore prosperity to the lands and bring the people out of the famine that had plagued their lands for some 18 years. Also, a famine lasting this long could have destabilized the social order, which could explain the split in the kingdom. Though, if Lydus was able to restore order, it could explain the kingdom being renamed in his honor in the following generations. This period of Lydian kings would be the first dynasty that we are aware of, though only coming to us through a literary tradition. We are not told how many generations it lasted, but it would finally come to an end seeing the second dynasty come to rule Lydian lands. The reason for the end of the first dynasty is unclear, as we find Herodotus saying, From these Lydians, the Heraclids were entrusted with the rule, obtaining it through the sanction of an oracle. Though, as we have seen many times, usually when an oracle is reported in this way, it is to legitimise one's position at the detriment of the regime being replaced. There is another point that may help explain the change of dynasty as well. To make this point, I need to fast forward a little, though we will get back on track. Herodotus reports that the Heraclides ruled for 505 years, with 22 generations. Now, we know from Herodotus that the last of the kings of the second dynasty would die around 687 BC, seeing the rise of the third, which is the one that Croesus would be a part of. So, if we add 505 to 687, we get ourselves 1192. And what event was taking place around the year 1192 BC? That's right, the Bronze Age collapse. So if these figures that we get from Herodotus are somewhat accurate, we can see why a new dynasty may have come about. Many kingdoms and empires were collapsing and being reshaped during these times. Okay, so back to the Heraclid dynasty. As you can guess from the name assigned to them, they were seen to have been descendants of Heracles. As we have spoken about before, Heracles was a hero who was tasked with completing 12 labours in the time of heroes, perhaps during the Bronze Age. Though when it comes to myth, time can be somewhat abstract. Heracles himself was a son of Zeus to a mortal woman, with Hera, Zeus's wife, extremely jealous of the affair and sending all sorts of ills Heracles' way. Heracles would defeat or overcome these challenges, ultimately gaining glory through Hera, literally his name, Heracles. During his labours, we could see that Heracles would go on to father a great many children, which would see there being no shortage of families, dynasties and groups of people claiming ancestry to Heracles. We have already seen the tale about the return of the Heraclidae, descendants of Heracles, into the Peloponnese, explaining how many of the regions would become Dorian. Now over in Anatolia, we get another of his descendants rise to power and form his own dynasty. This would be Agron, who we are told was the great-great-grandson of Heracles and a Lydian slave girl, though it is thought that the relationship could have been with Omphile, who was a legendary queen of Lydia. Heracles had spent a year in Lydia as a slave, completing a required year of servitude. Like I've said, we are unsure of what led to Agron coming to found a new dynasty in Lydia, though there was an oracle involved, and it appears it took place during the chaotic years of the Bronze Age collapse. The dynasty would last 505 years with 22 generations, son succeeding father all the way to the last in the line, Canjulis. It's at this point that we see the period in Lydia turn from legend or mythic to historical. This is where Herodotus begins his histories, where he would be focused on Croesus, the final Lydian king. Though he would first explain how the dynasty he was a part of, the third and final, would come to be. When I say this would move into the historical period, we need to keep in mind 
that many stories and legends still abound. But it appears certain types of records were now able to be accessed, as we find particular lengths of reign for all the kings of the Third Dynasty. We covered the tales that Herodotus relates about the transfer of power from Kanjulis to the founder, Gyges, of the Third Dynasty that would be known as the Myrmidades. I'm not going to cover over the tales Herodotus relates in any detail, as we have done so back when looking at the rise of the Persian Empire many episodes ago. I will just refresh our memories with the general tales as we move along, but see if we can unravel what the realities on the ground were during this period of this final dynasty. As I said, the dynasty was known as the Myrmidade, with it thought it had carrion origins, which would end up being a region just south of Ionia, though its origins stretching further back may have seen some roots in the northern parts of Anatolia. The transition from the Heraclidae to the Myrmidades is explained by Herodotus in a traditional tale seeking to reconcile a historical event. This is where the final Heraclidae king, Canjules, is murdered by Gyges, the founder of the Myrmidade. Though the tale would assure us this was not through his own motives, but rather a result of the previous king's actions. This is the story where Canjules is obsessed with the beauty of his wife and queen of Lydia. Not satisfied that anyone else understands her true beauty, he convinces Gyges, his most trusted bodyguard, to hide in his bedchamber, where he can see the queen undress. After some initial hesitation, he is then compelled to do as the king wishes. Once viewing the queen, he slips out of the room, though the queen had seen what had taken place. She was furious at her husband, and now sought her revenge. She convinced Gyges to hide in the room once again, but this time, kill the king for his actions that humiliated her. If Gyges did not comply, it would be he who would be killed. Gyges followed through, where he then became king and made the queen his new wife. There are a few other stories also relating to how Gyges came to the throne from other writers, but all result in him murdering Canjules. Another that Plato relates in the Republic has an ancestor of Gyges discovering a magic ring of invisibility. The ring is then used to seduce the queen, and then with her help kill the king, which would lead to a change in dynasties. Here we can also see some of the same themes that exist in Herodotus' account. As you can probably guess, taking the details in Herodotus' story at face value would be a little irresponsible. Nearly all legendary stories relating to the origin of people and places have a good dose of propaganda thrown in to try and convey the message the storyteller wants to put across. The story Herodotus probably inherited is what Gyges or his descendants wanted to put across to legitimise their coming to the power and hide over any traces of treachery that may have existed. Nevertheless, Gyges now on the throne would take measures in consolidating the kingdom he had just won. This would include capturing areas in the Troad, in the northwest, as well as perhaps some areas around the Greek cities on the coast, or at least forming agreements with a number of them. The true extent of the Lydian Empire at this stage is not entirely certain, but it is clear that Gyges had expanded it to some degree. Gyges was seen to have come to a power somewhere around the 680s BC, thanks to Assyrian inscriptions that refer to a Gagu of Ludu being identified with Gyges. He would have a fairly long reign, with him in power for almost 40 years. We saw he was concentrated on consolidating and growing the empire, while also turning it into a military power. During his reign, he would be faced with a number of invasions from people known as the Sumerians, who began as a nomadic Indo-European people first seen as entering into Anatolia around 1000 BC, from the Pontic Caspian steppe, northwest of the region. Over the centuries, groups of Sumerians would penetrate further west into Anatolia, which would end up seeing them come into Lydian lands. I just want to point out here that Herodotus doesn't connect these invasions to Gyges' time, telling us after describing his consolidation, that, however being his only act of any importance. But what we find when it comes to the historical period of Lydian history, is that Herodotus' chronology of events does not align too well with what is found in the official Assyrian documents. Pretty much everything we know about the Sumerian invasion comes from the Assyrians. We would end up hearing of three main invasions into Lydian lands that Gyges had to contend with. Perhaps this is why we hear him militarising his kingdom. The first would occur in 665 BC, where Gyges failed to receive Assyrian aid when preparing, though he would end up defeating the first invasion alone. The second would occur in 657 BC, though no other details are known in relation to this invasion, other than an Assyrian inscription calling it a bad omen for the West Land, Lydia being in the lands west of Assyria. 
Finally, a third invasion would take place, though this time in 644 BC. We hear that the Sumerians were successful and sacked the capital of Lydia, Sardis, with Gyges also being killed. The Assyrians would blame the Lydians' defeat on Gyges' arrogance and breaking off diplomatic ties with them, which would see the Lydians face the threat alone. Gyges' son Ardes would succeed him, though his reign would be fairly short. He had been left a kingdom in crisis. I just want to point out here, Herodotus has Ardes ruling for 49 years, but the lengths of time that Herodotus has various Lydian kings ruling would see its final king Croesus being conquered nearly 40 years later than he actually was. Many of the dates for these kings are not known for certain, but cross-referencing Herodotus with now translated Assyrian and Babylonian texts has helped. It would seem that the Sumerians had not stayed in possession of Sardis, as we hear of it being captured once again during Ardi's reign. We also hear that he was active in campaigns towards the Greek cities in the west, with some limited success, though Miletus appears to have remained independent. It is thought that during the sack of Sardis, during another Sumerian invasion, Ardes may have been killed, while it is also thought that his son would only rule for a short period, also due to the uncertain times in the kingdom. All we really know of his rule was that the kingdoms were still in great danger, and it appears he had relaunched another campaign directed at Miletus, along the Anatolian coast. In the later part of the 7th century, a new king would come to power that would finally see the Lydian kingdom stabilised and become the most powerful it had been so far, even now being described as the Lydian Empire. The Sumerian threat would finally be eliminated during Aliati's rule. It appears though a gradual weakening with not only the Lydians waging war against them. Though Herodotus places the expulsion of the Sumerians during his father's rule, most modern historians agree it was Aliates who finally rid his lands of the threat. We also hear that a number of Ionian and Carian cities were also defeated during the Lydian campaigning after having inherited a war directed west from his father, while a mutually beneficial agreement was struck with the city of Miletus. We will be looking a little deeper on the interactions between Miletus and Ionia with the Lydians in our interview episode that will be coming up. Aliette's reign would also see the invention of the coin, which was struck with electrum, an alloy of gold and silver, with other trace metals. Often his son Croesus is credited with the invention of coinage, though the oldest example can be dated to Aliette's reign, though Croesus would be the first to issue gold coinage. Aliette would have a long and stable reign, well from what we are told in the small amount of details that relate to his rule over half a century. The next Lydian king to come to the throne was his son Croesus, and he'd also be the final Lydian king. We have already covered much about Croesus back when we did our episode around the rise of Persia, so I'm not going to go into too much detail around him again but just set us up to where we can pick up events leading to the Ionian Revolt to be continued in another episode. I think the main point to stress with Croesus' rule was that this was the point where pretty much all of Ionia and the city of Miletus would finally come under the control of the Lydian Empire, as well as the other coastal areas north and south where more Greek colonies had been established by the Dorians and Aeolians. Croesus had also added other areas to his empire in the north, east and south, seeing the empire at its greatest extent, though with these gains he now saw a new threat on his borders to the east. As we saw earlier, the Persians had defeated the Medes to become the dominant group, seeing a rise in the Persian Empire, though the Medes would also hold a central role in this new empire. We will often find Greek writers referring to the Medes and Persians as the same people. The founder of the empire, Cyrus the Great, would expand east from the Iranian mountains through Bactria to the Indus Valley. In the north, the borders would touch the shores of the Aral Sea, Caspian Sea, and Black Sea, while in the south, it would extend along the Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea. Cyrus's campaigning would also see his territories advance westward, incorporating Mesopotamia and into Anatolia. This would see Persian control quickly arrive at the edge of the Lydian Empire. I think we will now finish up with one of the more famous tales from Croesus' reign, which was also his downfall ushering in a new era for the Greeks living along the Anatolian coastline. Before going to war with Cyrus, Croesus had consulted the Oracle of Delphi on the Greek mainland for advice on the matter. Herodotus records the response supposedly given to the Lydian heralds tasked with his mission. If Croesus were to wage war against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. With the message returned to Sardis, 
Croesus was delighted with what he had heard and made preparations to meet the Persians at battle. The first encounter would take place in Cappadocia, lands controlled by the Persians at this stage. This battle would turn out to be a stalemate, and Croesus decided to withdraw back to Sardis to collect a larger force to launch a renewed attack. Though he intended to do this in the next campaigning season, as winter was coming on. He had taken the measure to disband a great deal of his forces for the cold months that were coming on. What Croesus had not anticipated was that Cyrus was prepared to take risks. He pressed on into Lydian territory to see if he could force a decisive defeat before the cold set in. Much to Croesus' surprise, the Persians had arrived outside of Sardis, catching Croesus with a much smaller force now. Nonetheless, the Lydians gave battle, but were defeated and Sardis captured. So we see the words of the Delphic Oracle have predicted the outcome. They would have either way. A great empire had fallen, though Croesus had failed to see that the Oracle had been referring to his. Not only had this prophecy been fulfilled, but another five generations old had also come to fruition. We saw that Gyges had come to power through murdering the last king of the Heraclide dynasty. For his blood crime, there would also be consequences, though it would not be him who would suffer, but his descendants, specifically the fifth generation being Croesus. Supposedly his devotion and offerings to Delphi had seen his fate deferred. Though the Pythia had left Gyges with one departing line when he sought confirmation of his right to rule. Retribution would come from the Heraclides to the fourth descendant of Gyges. And as Herodotus says, like with how most would treat this news, the Lydians and their kings disregarded this part of the oracle until it actually came to pass. So, according to tradition, the Lydian Empire was fated to fall in the reign of Croesus. He himself had misread the oracle delivered to him, perhaps with some careful consideration of what the words meant, he could have saved himself. Though the wheels were in motion, fate could not be stopped. With the fall of the Lydian Empire, the Persian Empire would come to take its place, ruling the lands that had previously been under its control. The controlled territories would be trading one master for another. The Greeks on the coastline in Ionia had only spent a generation or two without their independence, though the Lydian defeat wouldn't see them regain it. As we will see next episode, eventually they would take matters into their own hands to try and break free from their new masters, the Persians. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for episode 47, Anatolia. Revolt in the West.